Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Gunn from Duke University. Here I will give you an overview of adaptive immune responses. After this lecture, you should be able to explain the adaptive immune system, describe the events that comprise an adaptive immune response, explain the basis for its antigenic specificity, and define clonal selection. We have just covered innate immune responses. Adaptive immune responses build off of innate responses. For most immune responses, Dendritic cells serve as the bridge between innate immunity and adaptive immunity. As a specialized type of phagocyte, these cells take a sample of pathogens and use this to initiate an adaptive immune response. They capture pathogen antigens and in response to pattern recognition receptor stimulation or alarm signals become activated. Once activated, they let go of the surrounding tissues and change their chemokine receptors in a way that allows them to migrate. Where do they go? Activated dendritic cells in most peripheral tissues or organs enter lymphatics and migrate to a secondary lymphoid organ where most adaptive immune responses are initiated. These include lymph nodes, spleen, and Peyer's patches and are the sites where antigen-presenting cells present antigen to the responding cells, which are naive lymphocytes that arrive from the blood. These include naive T cells and naive B cells. If a naive lymphocyte finds its cognate antigen, this initiates a primary or first adaptive immune response against this antigen. This is also known as priming. Events associated with this include antigen presentation, lymphocyte activation, lymphocyte proliferation, and the programming of lymphocytes toward a particular type of immune response. I said that the adaptive immune system is highly specific. The basis for this is that lymphocytes express highly specific antigen receptors. B cells express antibodies, while T cells express T cell receptors. Importantly, each cell expresses receptors with a single antigenic specificity. This takes us to a general problem faced by the immune system. You need about 10 to the 7th activated antigen-specific lymphocytes to control an infection. You have about 10 to the 7th to 10 to the 9th different antigen specificities. However, the total cells in the human body is only about 10 to the 14th. Thus, you cannot maintain enough lymphocytes to control infections at the steady state. During your life, you will only need a small proportion of the antigen specificities that you have. Also, the activities of antigen-specific lymphocytes need to be tailored to respond to a given infection. The solution to this problem is that you maintain a large number of different cell specificities but maintain a small number of cells of each specificity. Initially, all cells start out in an inactive or naive state. When stimulated with their specific antigen, these cells become activated, expand in number, and differentiate into effector or memory cells. This also allows the specific activity of cells to be programmed at the time of their stimulation. The key point here is that to generate an immune response against a certain antigen, a small number of B and T cell clones that bind to the antigen with high affinity undergo activation, proliferation, and differentiation into either plasma cells for B cells or activated T cells. This process is called clonal selection. The immune system selects and expands the clones that it needs when it needs them. So how does this work in practice? Let's say you are exposed to a single antigen to which B cells respond in the course of an infection. You have many B cells, each with a single specificity. Only one of your naive B cells can recognize this antigen. Most of your B cells will do nothing since they do not see their antigen, but this one B cell gets activated, proliferates, and differentiates into antibody-secreting plasma cells and to a lesser extent, memory B cells. Thus, the process of clonal selection provides enough antibody-producing cells to fight the infection 
and enough long-lived memory B cells to recognize the pathogen if you are re-exposed. Typically, a primary immune response results in the activation and expansion of three cell types. The first is effector CD4 cells or helper T cells. These cells perform a number of different functions. They provide help to CD8 cells, they help B cells, they migrate to tissues, they produce cytokines, and they activate macrophages. They also stimulate immune responses in other cell types. To perform these various activities, T helper cells come in multiple flavors. So what do I mean by different flavors? Helper T cell responses are tailored to the type of pathogen seen or the response needed. CD4 cells are programmed or polarized during their priming. This determines which cytokines that these cells produce. Th1 cells make interferon gamma. This activates macrophages for fighting intracellular microbes. Th2 cells makes interleukin-4 and interleukin-5. These stimulate antibody production and antiparasite responses. Th17 cells make interleukin-17. This stimulates neutrophil responses for fighting extracellular bacteria and fungi. The second cell type activated is effector CD8 positive T cells or cytotoxic T cells. These cells migrate into tissues and kill infected or abnormal cells. The third cell type activated is effector B cells, which make antibodies. These antibodies bind to and neutralize toxins, block virus infection, promote phagocytosis, activate complement, and trigger the activation of other cell types. At the same time you are generating effector cells, you are generating memory T cells and B cells so that you can remember and more rapidly respond to pathogens to which you have been exposed. Characteristics of immune memory include increased cell numbers, increased sensitivity. These cells are pre-programmed to be able to fight infections, and their activation is not dendritic cell dependent. All of the steps that I have just covered represent the sensitization phase of immune response. Once you are exposed to an antigen, you are sensitized to it. And once sensitized, your immune memory will last for years. Once you have generated all these effector cells, it is time for them to do something. This can be immediate or upon re-exposure to the pathogen. The action of effector cells is known as the effector phase of immune response. This includes CD4 cells migrating to tissue and stimulating additional innate cell recruitment and helping innate effector cells. It includes CD8 cells migrating to tissue and killing infected cells. It also includes antibodies performing the functions that we discussed previously. Now, the immune system is a powerful thing. Unfortunately, all of these toxic effector functions are not always confined to the pathogens. They can also injure our own tissues. This is known as immune pathology. A key point here is that in many immune-mediated diseases, especially autoimmune diseases, all we see is the immune pathology. We do not see and often do not understand how they are initiated, their antigen specificity, or their specific mechanisms. This is true for a large number of very common diseases. You may have wondered how we can get 10 to the 8th different antigen specific receptors when we only have about 25,000 genes. We will discuss this when we cover lymphocyte development which is the generation of mature but naive lymphocytes in the bone marrow and thymus. And finally, because the whole adaptive immune system is so potent, there are specialized mechanisms to make sure that you don't generate adaptive immune responses against your own tissues. These mechanisms are referred to as tolerance. They occur in primary lymphoid organs during lymphocyte development in a process known as central tolerance. 
and in secondary lymphoid organs in a process known as peripheral tolerance. This concludes our overview of the adaptive immune system.